It's probably obvious that I'm talking about sports camp, right? <laughs> and I think they need to go to sports camp. <laughs> Man, have you ever seen a team that was doing so poorly? I went to a game a week ago, and uh, I just haven't been able to watch since. I mean, I guess I'm a fair weather fan. Sorry about that. Hey, today I want to start a new series, and the series is going to kind of get bumped next week. I, I want to start this series today, and, and, and uh, the thing that I want to talk about is you don't get to pick your family, <laughs> right? You don't get to pick your family, and, and uh, you know, if you did, you'd probably pick someone else sometimes. <laughs> Some of you like to trade in a sibling, I know. Uh, there are a lot of others. Uh, some of us, kind of, I don't know, maybe somebody here came from an abusive family. You know? I, I had a wonderful family. If I could pick, I would have picked them. My, my, my family was great. Others would say, well, you know, I didn't have a great childhood. You don't get to pick your family. Now, the second thing that I notice, in fact, is that you don't even get to pick your place of birth. You didn't. You didn't get to pick the place. The book of Exodus starts that way, and we're going to study a character by the name of Moses and his spiritual journey that he went on. And in the spiritual journey, the book begins by saying, he's an immigrant. He's a son of an immigrant, a grandson of an immigrant. 400 years prior, Joseph had entered into Egypt, and in Egypt, it says here, these are the names of the sons who came from Egypt with Jacob. And it lists the 11 sons and then jo Joseph, the brother. It says the total number of people were 70. When you count their kids and everything, grandkids. It says and Joseph was already in Egypt. So the 12 of them are down in Egypt. And Joseph died a long time ago, like 300 years ago. And it goes on, it says, and then Joseph died and all his brothers and, and the whole generation died off. He, so Moses is the immigrant. He's born, it's like uh, my grandparents were from Germany. Well, great-grandparents were from Germany. And uh, they were immigrants to America. And so I'm the grandson of immigrants way back. You see what I'm saying? And, and so, uh, but he's, in a, he, he's this immigrant. This is really not his land. God promised them a different land. And, and he, he didn't get to pick his place of birth. You didn't either. I didn't get to pick to be born in Michigan. My parents picked this as the place. They migrated from Missouri to Michigan, all right? There's some things you just don't get to pick. One of them's the place of your birth. Now, now, there's another one that you don't get to pick, and that is the circumstances into which you were born. I love the History Channel, and every now and then I say, man, I sure wish I'd been born during the Roman Empire. Oh, my goodness. What, what, what a majestic empire. But then, uh, you know, I get a cavity and say, you know, I'm kind of glad I live in the... <laughs> I live in the 21st, 20th, 21st century. And everything that I have, I didn't get to pick the circumstances of the time in which I was born. My dad was of the great generation. Uh, as a child, he was in the roaring 20s, which was followed by the Great Depression. He didn't get to pick those times. I don't get to pick the times I'm in. It says, now a new king arose over Egypt. As time went on, there's this new king. Something that's actually a dynasty, a new dynasty took place of the previous dynasty. We won't get into all those details, but there's this king that arose and he, he said to his people, look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than, they, than we. What had happened is God said it back in Genesis 15 that for 400 years they would be in a land that's not theirs and there they would multiply and grow and God would bring them back to Canaan and that would be their land. And God was fulfilling his promise. The Israelites were growing like crazy from 70 people to over 2 million people in that 400 years. And so there's this uh, worry on the inside okay, because of these circumstances. What if we go to war and these immigrants, these Hebrews, identify with our enemy and they, or they flee or they identify with our enemy and attack us from within us? There's a strategical problem here. We've got to reduce their numbers. And so the first thing they did, it says, and they made their lives bitter, bitter. I don't know what your circumstances are here today. You can't control them. 
Maybe recently the doctor told you, you've got something that's not going to go away. We don't know what we can do. You just got to live with this the rest of your life. Circumstance have not gone the way you have planned. A lot of us will say when, we, when they, they approach retirement years, uh, I don't know, I blew it somewhere. I don't have as much money as I thought I had planned on to get here. Because I, the circumstances of the great crash of a few years ago, where everything went in half, uh, this is not my plan, my circumstance. And so what they were doing is they were making their lives bitter. They didn't like what was happening in their lives. They continued to grow. So the king had the strategy, he says, hey, tell the midwives uh, that when the babies are born, when you see them on the birth stool, if it's a boy, kill the boy immediately. And then you can tell the mom, oh, it was stillborn, just kill it. But if it's a girl, let it live. Hey, we need those women to serve, but hey, we don't want those men because they could be an army. Then Pharaoh commanded the people later because what happened was the midwives wouldn't do it. They feared God. They saw what God was doing among the Israelites. They wouldn't do it. And so they continued to multiply. Pharaoh says, why, why are you not killing those, those babies when they're born? They said, oh, these Israelite women, they're not like the Egyptian women. They deliver quickly. Before we get there, they're already born. And so the Bible says God blessed them for protecting the Israelite women. So he came up with a second scheme. We find that in verse 22 of this chapter, the first chapter of Exodus. Pharaoh commanded his people, every boy that is born a Hebrew, you shall throw in the Nile, and everyone that is a girl, you're going to let her live. These were the circumstances in which they were living. Moses didn't get to pick the circumstances in which he lives, and you and I don't get to pick the circumstances in which we find ourselves often. I don't get to pick that. Somebody else picks that for me. You know what else? You don't get to pick your parents. I didn't get to pick my parents. It says, now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. She conceived and bore a son and she saw that he was a fine baby and she hit him for three months. You don't get to the sixth chapter, you find out that his name is Amram, uh, uh, Aram, and her name is Jacobed. And uh, that was their name. I didn't get to pick Bill and Velda to be my parents. You didn't get to pick your parents either. You see, there's some things in life, God does the picking. You have no control over that. Problem is, some people feel it is their fault because a parent abused them. No, it's not. You didn't get to pick your parent. It was outside your control. This is so important because you can't blame yourself for circumstances and things that you did not pick, but that they picked you. They picked you. We go on in this passage, and the next thing it says is you don't get to pick your gender. I know that. This is like a hot potato this week, isn't it? I can't believe I, I made this outline of this passage like uh, two months ago. And uh, that's the way God works in my life. It just happens providentially that, uh, yeah, uh, no, you don't get to pick your gender. And, and I could go on probably for an hour or so just on this one point because the Bible is quite clear. But I don't even have to use the Bible to prove this. I don't have to. Uh, all right. A child would understand this. I have two cars out in the parking lot. I have a white GMC terrain, and I have a black Subaru. I like my Subaru. In fact, it's got a little more pep than my GMC. So maybe I decide I don't want my GMC to be a GMC anymore. I want it to be a Subaru. <laughs> because it's black, I'm going to go get some paint. I'll paint it black. Oh, it's got, it's got a GMC logo on it? I'm just going to go get a Subaru logo and put it on it. Now i got two Subarus, right? A child will tell me, you're, you know what they say? You're crazy. <laughs> yeah, they'd say to me, you're crazy. That's a freak. <laughs> That's what they tell me. 
I mean, even they, even they get it. Listen, God assigned your gender. Even science tells us that. Do a DNA check on yourself. The easiest thing that's going to find is whether you're a male or a female. No matter how you mutilate your body, no matter how you decorate your appearance, your chromosome, whether you have an X or a Y, that makes you a male. If you have a, you know, a X and an X, then you're a female. And then no matter what you do to the outside, God has picked your gender. You didn't get to pick that. You don't get to pick that. The Bible tells me in Romans chapter 1, neither were they thankful about God the Creator, and they became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was dark, and professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and worshipped and served the, creator rather, uh, the creature rather than the Creator. And that's exactly what we've got going on today. People who shut God out of their life are totally confused because they have no absolute standard for their life. They don't know who they are. They don't know who they are. Once you know Jesus as your Savior, you know who you are. You have an authority for your life. You have bearing in your life. People need the Lord. Now more than ever, people need the Lord. If simply they can find out who they are, because you don't get to pick your gender. You don't get to pick your gender. And then the next one here, all right, my, I'm not clicking, so the battery must have gone. If you'd advance that slide for me, thank you. The Bible actually says this about those, about our culture. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Woe to those who put darkness for light and light for darkness. Woe who put bitterness for sweet and sweet for bitterness. Can I add one? Woe to those who put male for female and female for male. All right? And that's what he's talking about. We don't, we don't get to choose this stuff. God has already done it for us. Now, the next one here is uh, you don't get to pick your sibling. All right? You don't get to pick your sibling. You see, when uh, Jacobed could hide him no longer, she put him in a little basket, threw him in the Nile River, just as she was supposed to do, and it floated down. But his sister stood at a distance. See, he's got a sister. He didn't get to pick that Mir Miriam would be his older sister. He didn't get to pick that. She was already. You didn't get to pick your sibling. We go on a little bit further in the passage. It tells us he didn't get to pick his own adoption. You see, the daughter of Pharaoh, she comes by and she sees this in the river. She sees the basket and sends one of her servants, get that basket out. And when the, she opened it and the child was crying, she looked at him and she said, must be one of the Hebrew kids. And as we read further in the passage, his sister said, oh, to Pharaoh, he said, oh, shall I not go and get a nurse from among the Hebrew woman uh, so that she can nurse for you? And the Pharaoh's daughter said, oh, great idea. Why don't you go do that? And so the girl went and got Jacobed. So Jacobed gets to raise her, her own son. This is great. Now, listen, she knew she only had him for a temporary time until the child was weaned. Now, in the ancient culture, that could be up to five years old, okay? Uh, and, but uh, I don't know, anywhere up to five years old. But it says, it says it's a Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take the child. I'll give you wages to even do this. Don't, don't get much better than that. They're paying you to raise your own kid. So the woman took the child and nursed it. And when the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and she took him as her son. Adopted kids have a real special place in my heart. I have an adopted son. And it's so funny, if I line my three sons up, you'd all pick the wrong one. Drives my biological son crazy. Why they always pick me as being adopted? His younger brother just smiles. Yeah. My son didn't get to pick his adoption. He had a mom that uh, was a teenage young lady, got pregnant unexpectedly, realized she couldn't care for the child, placed the child up for adoption, and uh, the doctor called us, asked us if we wanted to adopt. Isn't that great? Said, yeah, I mean, it was a win. We were trying to become foster parents, and he had to sign a, a letter for that. And he said, rather than being foster parents, how would you like to adopt? So listen, you got plenty of time. Three weeks later, we had a baby. <laughs> His idea of plenty of time and mine, whew, 
Yeah. You don't even get to pick any of that. Listen, I go on, there's a lot of things. You don't get to pick your childhood. The child grew up. The child grew up, was placed in Pharaoh's home. He's now a king. Son makes him a prince. Although there's another prince in line before him, but uh, he's in succession there if something should happen. All right. He didn't get to pick that. He's, he's trained and educated in all the schooling of the Egyptians. Hey, he didn't get to pick that. He didn't even get to pick his name. How many of you here got to pick your name? Uh, I didn't see any hands go up. No. We don't get to pick our name. His name is called Moses because she pulled him out of the water. My name was Bruce for about 30 minutes. And then my mom said, oh my goodness, Bruce. We had a neighbor had a dog named Bruce. I can't call my son. <laughs> she said, all I can think of is somebody kicking that dog. I don't want anybody kicking my son. And then she said, oh, and then it popped in her head. There was a Bruce floor wax. I never heard of it. But she said, I just don't want people walking all over my son. And so she changed my name to Dennis because if I had been a girl, I would have been to be Denise. And the name Denise comes from the Greek goddess Dionysius, which is the goddess of drunkenness and debauchery. <laughs> I said, Mom, what were you thinking? <laughs> Moses is called Moses because I drew him out of the water. Listen, you don't get to pick your name and all of this. Like, you can't pick your birthplace, your birth date, your gender, your family, your circumstances, your adoption. You can't pick any of that. But you do get to pick some things in life. Those are all circumstances you can't control. But now I'm going to give you some that you can. You can pick your loyalties. Who are you loyal to? One day after Moses was grown up, he went out to his people and he saw their forced labor and he saw the Egyptians beating a Hebrew and uh, one of his kinfolks and immediately he stopped identifying with the tyrants who were Egyptians and he started identifying with, with his own people who were ill-treated. He had a cushy life. But, but there was a compassion in his heart that went out for the people who were the underdogs. Right, I've got to ask this question. Who's like me? I always cheer for the underdog. I don't know. I, I always cheer. If, if, if it's not my tigers, which are the underdogs. Uh, <laughs> I still cheer for the underdog. I don't know why. Moses identifies with them instead. He picked his loyalties. Who is he going to identify with? So he looked this way, he looked that way, and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian. He was going to deliver. He wanted to rescue them. And he hid in the sand. Well, I, I know. He had to have done a better job than that. <laughs> but he didn't do a good enough job that he didn't get found out. All right? You see, I don't pick my circumstances, but I do pick my loyalty and my actions. I choose what I'm going to do. I choose when a situation is not how I like it, how I'm going to act on that situation. I do make choices every day. Moses was born in circumstances he didn't like, and he, later he's going, right, right here, he's choosing to do this liberation of his people without God. Later, God is going to use him to liberate his people. And at that time, he's choosing to do it in a whole different way. We make choices every day. And we're accountable for our choices. Not only does he, does he get to pick his actions, he gets to pick his reactions. When Pharaoh found out about it, because it's found out one next day, uh, there's two Hebrews that are fighting. And Moses says, hey, stop fighting with one another, don't you? And he said, what are you going to do? Kill me like you did the Egyptian? He knew the word was out. The word went to Pharaoh the king, and Pharaoh was out for him. And he says, when Pharaoh heard it, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh. There's the reaction. It's called fight or flight. He flight. <laughs> He's out of there. It's a normal reaction. You see, I am in control of my actions, and I pick my actions, I pick my reactions every day. How I'm going to respond to my circumstances, I pick that. When somebody does something I don't like, how I'm going to react to that, I pick those choices every day. goes on, I, I, I get to pick those. Those are some of the things I do get to pick. You also get to pick your spouse. You may not have got to pick your parents, but you did get to pick your spouse. 
the story goes on, talks about how he met Ruel, uh, and that Ruel had these seven daughters, and he helped the seven daughters, and Ruel said, hey, come and stay the night with us, and, and one thing led to another, and pretty soon he falls in love with Zipporah, and he marries her. You may not have got to pick your parents, but you do get to pick your, your spouse. So you know what I say? Pick wisely. Often people are in marriage problems. They got problems. I say, well, wait a minute, buddy. You better just suck it up. You picked her. <laughs> you picked her. We need to pick wisely. See, you, you, there are things that you do get to pick. You do get to pick your faith. After the king of Egypt died, the Israelites groaned under their slavery and they cried out to, to God. God heard their groanings and God remembered his covenant, the covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the patriarchs. And God looked upon the Israelites and God noticed him. Moses picks God. That's what we're going to see the rest of the, the series unfold, how Moses picks God. Now, now next time we're going to find God also picks Moses. God picks Moses, he picks God. Pharaoh doesn't pick God, and God doesn't pick Pharaoh. We're going we're to see how this all unfolds. There's something. You pick your faith. You pick your commitments. You pick. You choose all these things. And the, I have to ask this. What do we learn here? You don't get to pick a whole bunch of things in life, but you do also get to pick a whole bunch of things in life. Here's the point. You need to know the difference. Instead of beating yourself up for things you cannot change, you've got to learn to accept those. Instead of dismissing the things you can change, you've got to start changing those things. You've got to know the difference. This le le led a great American theologian to write what was known as the serenity prayer. God grant me the serenity, a peaceful spirit, to accept the things I cannot change. There's some things I just can't change. Courage to change the things that I can. Yeah, I need courage to change what can be changed. And here's the best part. Wisdom to know the difference. To know the difference. Amen? Great prayer. Let me sum it all up. By faith, Moses, when he was growing up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Choosing. There's that word. He didn't get to pick to be the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Mm -mm. Somebody else picked that for him. But he did pick, rather, to share in ill treatment with God's people, rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, the fleeting pleasures of sin. And they're only fleeting. We often pick on the altar of the eternal. We pick the immediate Immediate gratification, not looking at the eternal implications. And so my bottom line is, choose or pick wisely. Choose or pick wisely. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. It truly is a light unto our path. It's a guide to our lives. This week there will be circumstances that are outside our control. Lord, we know that we're not accountable for those outside our control. But we will be accountable for our actions and reactions and choices that we make that you grant us to make. Help us, Lord, to choose wisely. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we dismiss, I want to just remind you that uh, Jim and Kathy are going to be at the back door. And uh, you just give them a right hand of fellowship and welcome into our church as you depart. And uh, I want to also s uh, remind you that there's a standing invitation here at Bethany Church to make the, Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, to confess him as the Son of God, the Christ, your Lord and Savior. And if you've not done that in a personal way, like Kathy was saying, she knew about him for years, but she didn't make him that personal Lord until a, a time of difficulty, stress in her life. Just on the way out, say, Pastor, can I meet with you for a moment? That's kind of code words that say, I, I want to talk to you about some spiritual things. No matter what the spiritual thing, it's just that if you, if you want to have a relationship with Christ, 
Maybe you say, I, I need to be baptized too. Or, or maybe you're, you're saying, I'd like to become a membership of Bethany Church. You just say, Pastor, can I speak to you for a few minutes? We'll break away from everybody else so that uh, we can just talk one-on-one. -on -one. And uh, whatever your need may be, then we'll take that time for it. Let's pray now. Father in heaven, bless the meal we're about to partake of. Bless our day that we might bring glory to you. We ask, O oh Lord, that you give us wisdom to know the difference between those things that we cannot change and just accept them as that and then change the things that we can. For we ask this in our Savior's name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. We've already prayed for the meal. Enjoy.